ಅಖಂಡಿದಂದ ಅವಾಂಗಮನಸಗೋಚರ ಆತ್ಮಾಧಾರ So we have been studying the Vedanta Sara and let us remember the purpose of studying the Vedanta Sara that it will give us a foundation um, for an entry into the Upanishads. So in the Vedanta Sara we were on text number 15. What is going on now? when we enter into the study of any of these classical texts we know that there are four preliminaries which we we have to uh, take care of which which we have to pay attention to they are called anubandha chatushtaya these are the these are the four preliminaries which encourage us uh, which uh, inspire us to study the text one is vishaya what is the subject matter the second one is adhikari who is qualified to study it um in fact adhikari is first because we are studying that now adhikari who is qualified to study it subject matter what 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 is it that we are studying what's the book about third is sambandha relation between the subject matter and the text itself and then the last one is prayojana which means the purpose the goal what are we studying what do we intend to get out of this so in that the first topic first preliminary is the discussion of adhikari who is qualified we remember that by adhikari they mean if a person is pro- properly qualified then a systematic study of the text will lead to enlightenment will lead to the promised results but even if we lack the qualifications we'll still gain something by study of the text now what are the qualifications this was outlined in this very long sentence in text number 6 uh, if you remember adhikari tu vidivad adhita veda vedangatvena apatato adhigata akhila vedartha asmin janmani janmantare va kamya nishiddha vajjana purassaram nitya naimittika prashchitta upasana anushthanena nirgata akhila kalma shataya nitanta nirmala swanta sadhana chatushtaya sampanna pramata a long sentence which we broke up into uh, parts and we took to can look at all the components basically the idea was that by leading a moral life a religious life one becomes competent for the study of vedanta what is the nature of this competence four characteristics um, they called sadhana chatushtaya the four fold practices which uh, enable us to study vedanta fruitfully so the last phrase is important in this long sentence in text 6 sadhana chatushtaya sampanna pramata adhikari adhikari means the qualified student and what what do these words mean pramata the knower the enquirer the one who wants to know who is who has these four qualifications sadhan chatushtaya sampanna equipped with the four qualifications all right so what are these very important four qualifications uh that's in text number 15 where we are starting today the, the, this is the important part uh, what are the four qualifications don't confuse it with the four preliminaries four preliminaries are the competent student the subject matter the relation between the text and the subject matter and then the um, the purpose of the study that's the four preliminaries we are studying that in the four preliminaries in the first one competent student competent student needs four qualities or four practices that's what we are doing now sadhan chatushta text number 15 sadhanani nitya anitya vastu viveka iha mutrartha phala bhoga viraga kshamadi shatka sampatti mumukshutvani so these are the four qualifications what are they the means to the attainment of knowledge are one discrimination or let us say discernment between things permanent and transient between what is permanent eternal what is transient non eternal temporary changing one two renunciation of the enjoyments of the fruits of actions in this world and hereafter that means not pursuing worldly goals or even other worldly goals we'll see what that means third 
the six treasures, basically discipline, shat sampatti, such as control of the mind, etc. And fourth, probably the most important, the desire for spiritual freedom. It's what Sri Ramakrishna used to call Vyakulata in the Bhakti language. It is Vyakulata. Vyakulata means an intense restlessness for God. A, a, a strong, a deep restlessness, divine discontent for God realization, a hunger, a thirst for God. That is called Vyakulata. That's in the language of Bhakti, devotion. The same thing in this path is called Mumukshutvam, intense desire for freedom, an intense inquiry. Um, so, so these are the four qualifications. Now, just one, a couple of words before we go in. One is that um, uh, the fourfold qualifications, when we go into this, when you listen to this list, you may have this question. It sounds like a strange list. When you want somebody to be spiritual, to be a spiritual person, what are the qualifications you would expect of a saintly person? You know, the person must be honest, must be loving, must be unselfish, must be disciplined. Um, but these seem to be quite different from uh, that list. So what's going on here is all that is already assumed by leading a moral life, a dharmic life, which, which has two components, a moral life and a religious life. By leading a, a, um, a good life, one is already a good person. One is already a good person. So these are higher practices which prepare the ground for Vedanta. So the basic idea of being a good person is assumed. It's, it's already known. One can't be a villain and then jump to enlightenment. One has to go through a period of moral and ethical life. Um, that's one. I, I know that Swami is you know, in our monastery, Swami Ashoka Anji and others also. They used to tell young men who would come to become monks, would say, become a gentleman first. So that's a very good way of putting it. Before you acquire these qualities, one is a gentleman, that means a good person first. And then uh, a good person, a cultured person, and then you acquire these qualities. Second thing I wanted to say was, don't be intimidated. As we go into it, don't be intimidated by this and feel um, you know, helpless. Oh, I don't have these qualities. Maybe it's, it's not for me. No. It is for everybody. According to Advaita Vedanta, we are Brahman. Why should it not be for me? This whole book is about what I truly am. Um, so maybe I have many uh, problems with the conditioning of my mind. Maybe I have physical problems and so on and so forth. But my nature is that I am the spirit. I am Brahman. I am one with God. Why should it be beyond me? As Ramana Maharshi said, I've said again and again, you know, somebody went and asked him, am I qualified for Vedanta? And he said, did you say I? You know, his method was, who am I? So if you can say I, you're qualified. If you can just say I, everybody can say I. So you're qualified to ask, who am I? You're therefore qualified for Vedanta. So yes, in one sense, we are all qualified. Just that um, maybe we don't have enough of these uh, qualities. They are not at the level of excellence. So we need to keep an eye. When you drive, you keep an eye on the gas, you keep an eye on your speed, you keep an eye on certain things when you're driving. Similarly, in the spiritual path, there are certain things you need to keep an eye on. And these four are very important. This is where the shoe pinches. In practical terms, when we run into trouble in spiritual life, you'll almost always notice it is something to do with these four, one or more of these. When you come back and look at it. Where am I lacking? Do I lack dispassion? Do I lack... Uh, conviction that there is this ultimate reality. Do I lack discipline? Or just do I lack the motivation? That mumukshutvam, the final one. All right, now let's get into it. So the, we know by now the method, they will give us a list and then they will take up each item in the list and define it. So fourfold practices, um, the fourfold means for attaining, let's just call it means, four means for attaining knowledge. First one, it is called Viveka. Viveka, that's, that's where the name Vivekananda comes from. Viveka means Vivich Prithakkarana in Sanskrit, uh, to separate, to, to discern between two things. Two things which are coming to us mixed up. Right and wrong, they come to us mixed up. And it's a common term in all Indian languages. In Bengali, we say Vivek. 
it's it it stands for conscience that something that tells me what is right and what is wrong so that's uh, that's for everybody but here viveka is in a higher spiritual sense the ability to distinguish between the eternal and the non eternal there is god or there is brahman the, the ultimate reality and there is this world so vivek it's all an entirely an inner uh, conviction and inner clarity number 16 नित्यानित्यवस्तु विवेकस्तावत् ब्रह्मैव नित्यं वस्तु ततो अन्यद् अखिलम् अनित्यमिति विवेचनम् सो व्हाट इज विवेक नित्यानित्यवस्तु विवेक विवेक मींस द एबिलिटी टू सेपरेट एंड देयर मे बी डिफरेंट काइंड्स ऑफ विवेक एज आई सेड द द एबिलिटी टू डिस्टिंग्विश बिटवीन राइट एंड रॉन्ग फॉर एग्जांपल बट हियर व्हाट इज मेंट द एबिलिटी टू डिस्टिंग्विश डिसर्न बिटवीन व्हाट इज इटर्नल permanent and what is transient non eternal temporary that the kind of feeling that there is a spiritual reality which is eternal which is worth having worthwhile and the rest in this world whatever is going on is non eternal secondary unimportant so what is this viveka he says brahmaiva nityam vastu the eternal reality is brahman you will define what is brahman later on um so brahmhi vanityam vastu brahman is the eternal reality tato anyat other than that anyat other than brahman akhilam everything else whatever is is other than brahman anityam iti is non eternal secondary unimportant but non eternal iti vivechanam this insight this inside this separation discernment discernment is a very good word vivechanam is discernment so this insert uh, this discernment is called viveka this is very important then the next one vairagya vairagya means mind has been colored purifying or cleansing the mind of this coloring what coloring the coloring of the world mind has been dipped in the dye of the world so much it has taken on the color of the world it has to be cleansed so vairagya raga also means attachment vairagya means dispassion passion dispassion so number 17 text number 17 what is vairagya aihi ka naam srak chandana vanita vi vishaya bhoga naam karma janya taya अनित्यत्वद्वदिराग्यूर्ट्रिस्पैशन टूवर्ड्स trying to enjoy um the results of my karma here and hereafter here here amutra hereafter that means in heaven after death so the uh, idea in the vedic religion and in hinduism in fact in buddhism and all the other indian religions is that everything is ruled by karma good karma leads to merit in sanskrit it is called punya and that generates happiness happiness means things will go well for you body will be healthy people will be nice to you you, you will earn money if you you will be successful in your job and your education in your relationships things will generally go well for you um so that is a sign of good karma but go well for you in the worldly sense and uh, bad karma so that leads to what is called papa or demerit and that gen- that generates dukkha suffering disease uh, failure frustration uh, unhappiness bad relationships all those things whatever is unpleasant in life comes from our bad karma and both of our 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 karma what we have done this is something that we have arranged for ourselves and swami vivekananda used to say none to blame so there is no one else to blame it is action and consequence uh, cause and effect so this is from our past karma which is giving results now um so if you want a very good life 
you would obviously that you are encouraged to do you are encouraged to do good karma dharma is good karma consciously done ethical action is dharma consciously done unethical action is adharma so dharma leads to punya merit punya leads to sukha happiness adharma leads to papa demerit and demerit leads to dukkha unhappiness this is the law of karma it not only applies here in this world it also applies to after death so we have had many lives and future lives are also ruled by karma in between lives we go to what are called hells or heavens these are all temporary places hells are the nasty places there are seven of them and the heavens are the good places there are seven of those actually 14 worlds one of them actually in between is the earth so actually the hells are fewer in number there are six unless you count the earth as as a hell also so um so there are these 14 worlds half of them are better each the higher one higher means subtler and subtler those are better and better and the grosser ones are worse and worse one go after death one goes to one of these places depends depending on uh, one's karma so good karma you go to heaven and things are very nice it's a party there um you needn't even wear your mask so you can party for, for centuries together and they have a choice of drinks and the drinks are they are all varieties of what is called amrita nectar so the gods drink that i don't know if they get maybe it comes in different flavors orange flavor or lime flavor whatever they don't get bored and because they drink that they are immortal immortal means they last for a long time and uh, they don't have old age they don't have disease they don't have hunger and thirst so it's just being merry but that's also limited once our good karma runs out uh, we are back the gita says shine punya matyalokam vishanti when our good karma runs out as we are having fun we are using up all our credit but equally when we suffer they are also using up our bad karma we are exhausting our bad karma so in that sense suffering is good and enjoying is bad because you are using up all your <laughs> credit by enjoying and uh, you are exhausting bad karma by suffering anyhow we come back from there so after that also we come back what he's saying here is all of it is worthless this whole thing is worldly this world heavens and hells heavens hell and earth all of those you should have you should turn away from this if you want vedanta uh, if you want vedanta if you want enlightenment this is all within the cycle of maya um, so all of this is what was earlier classified as anitya nitya anitya eternal non eternal all these are non eternal whatever you get in this world including this very life this body all non eternal it will go away one day and whatever we get in in heaven also those are also even if they last a long time they are also non eternal one day it will be over and we'll be back here again so it's a wise person who want who give all those up, all those up um we had this swami who explained it very nicely his whole concept of heaven in vedanta um swami nishreya shanand ji who was the head of our vedanta society in south africa he founded our vedanta work in south africa he came to this country there are a few people i think peter fell is here in this uh, uh, today's class maybe uh, and uh, he knew uh, he, he was close to swami nishreya shanand ji um so he had a wonderful wonderful way of explaining things this whole idea of heaven he says what is it like so you earn a lot of money and then you use that money to buy a ticket from south africa to mumbai maybe we board the plane in johannesburg and there is an air hostess who will come and say come come this is your seat this is exactly vedic language you know when one dies a divine form appears and says a hey, he a hey, he come here come here this is your this is the world earned by you by your merits so by performing many vedic sacrifices you have accumulated punya lot of merit and hence you go to get to go to this very special you know uh, pg or some hawaii or something like that heavenly level so the aerostus comes and says come come this is your seat and you sit down and it's cool air condition and it's all very nice and comfortable then you are at 36000 feet and cruising at 800 miles an hour and um, then you are you watch movies and uh, there is food and drink brought to you everything is nice and then you are told 
you're descending into Mumbai. And then when things are really going well and you're happy, you say, all right, thank you for flying with Air India. Uh, we have reached Mumbai, the temperature is 40 degrees, or, I mean, the temperature is like 100 degrees outside in Fahrenheit and with 100% humidity. Thank you for flying with us. And we said, no, no, I want to stay here. This is nice. And so then you have to buy a ticket again, uh, come back again, fly with us again, which means it's like you're back to the earth. You have to earn your punya again to blah, blah, buy a ticket for the heavenly airlines. So it's, it's a cycle and uh, it, it's exhausted. So that is, this is here, it's called Amutra Phala Bhoga. Amutra means hereafter. Phala Artha Bhoga. Phala means Karma Phala, the result of Karma. Artha, what is provided by that? Bhoga, enjoyment. This is what one has to turn away from. I remember one more word about this. Many years ago when we were studying this, um, um, the Swami who was teaching us I think it's Swami Shiva Mayanji, probably. Um, so when you say that, that you, to be a Vedanta student, you must give up enjoyment here and hereafter. So we all said, many of us said, oh, we don't want heaven. We don't want these heavenly pleasures. And the, the Swami smiled and said, just because you don't believe in heaven. <laughs> it's, so that's why you're so eager to give it up. And remember, our ancestors actually believed that these things, and they are true. So... You can't give up a cookie in this world and you want to give up uh, heavenly pleasures. Not so easy. So, but one has to. These are all non-eternal. And that's why we turn away from it. And what Vedanta promises is eternal. Now let's break it up. Aihikanam. The objects which we will have uh, in this world, uh, in this life, Aihika. What are they? Examples. Shrak. Uh, I'll explain later. Struck means sandal paste. A struck is a, is, a, uh, is a garland, flower garland. Chandana, sandal paste. Uh, vanita, women. Etc. Adi, etc. Vishaya bhoga, and sources of enjoyment. Karma janyataya, because they are produced by work, by the result of action. Anitya, the enjoyment will be uh, temporary, uh, will, be, will, will be impermanent. Amushmikanam, um, the hereafter, the enjoyments hereafter. What are they? Um, api means also, hereafter also. Amrita Adi, nectar, etc. All the heavenly pleasures like nectar, etc. Vishaya Bhoga, enjoyment of heavenly objects. Vishaya means objects, here it means heavenly objects. Uh, Anityataya, they are also impermanent. One day it will be over. Uh, and you will say that it is time to get down. Thank you for flying with us. 100 degrees outside. Have a nice day. Tebhyo nitaram virati. From all of this, nitaram, consistently withdrawal from all of this. These are no longer my goals. You may be in the middle of it. You may be here in the middle of all of this. Uh, your karma will, your past karma will keep producing. Um, and will give you, keep on giving results and you will keep on getting this. If you do a job, you'll get your salary. If you are, um, uh, you can be in the middle of your family, you could be in the middle of you have relationship, all those things are there. But that's no longer your goal in life. You are not looking to those things to produce, uh, to, to give you peace or happiness. You know their limitations. Just one word here. So what does it mean, flower garlands? Flower garlands and sandal paste is the, the ancient equivalent of jewels and you know Tiffany's and, and perfumes. And this reference to women, remember it was uh, like taught to mostly men and to monks. So that's why the reference to, to women as objects of enjoyment. So this, uh, I mean, Sri Ramakrishna, somebody said, did he, was he misogynistic? He would keep warning his disciples against women. But his women disciples said that he, uh, he again and again warned them against too much closeness to men. So uh, the, the principle here is the same. All right. Um, all right. Now let me move on. You hold on to the questions. You can chat. Um, you can give the questions, or you can raise your hand. We'll just finish these, and then I'll take them up. Then eighteen. Shamadayastu, shamadamo uparati titiksha, samadhana shadhakya ha. 
the shama etc the six fold treasure are shama dama uparati titiksha samadhana shraddha so what do they mean the six fold treasures are um, restraining of the outgoing mental propensities shama dama is the restraining of the external sense organs uparati is the withdrawal of the uh, withdrawing of the self or withdrawal of the mind from the world titiksha is forbearance samadhana is focus and uh, shraddha is faith so here's a little bit of cheating here four uh, means for realization so in the fourth in the third means they have packed in six more so the total is now nine uh, viveka vairagya then six more and then finally mumukshutra so nine in total what are the, these uh, six they are disciplines of various sorts we will see them in detail one by one first shama number 19 shama stavat shravanaadi vyatirikta vishayebhyo manaso nigraha shama is the curbing of the mind from all objects except except hearing etc so what does it this mean shama is calmness of mind quietening of the restlessness of the mind shama stavat so shama means shravanaadi vyatirikta vishayebhyo manaso nigraha control of the mind pulling back the mind from everything other than shravana manana nididhyasana that means vedanta shravana manana nididhyasana means um, engaging the mind in study and in reasoning and in meditation basically the the three uh, practices of vedanta shravana manana nididhyasana what we are doing right now is shravana right now we are doing shravana when you ask questions and discuss it that is manana and then when clarity comes you settle down with it that is nididhyasana and it says here withdrawal of the mind shama is withdrawal of the mind. but we're not withdrawal from everything withdrawal from everything except this that means focus on these three activities so i mean vivekananda said it again he said keep these high thoughts before the mind again and again we have hypnotized ourselves into pettiness into smallness so this thing is deep hypnotization keep these high vedantic thoughts before your mind all the time then so you can see if those were following the sanskrit um so by the way sanskrit don't be put off if you're not interested not following the sanskrit there's no problem at all those who have the pdf which i had sent there the transliteration is also there in the english you can follow the sanskrit if you just want to but if you don't want to it's all right we'll translate every word if i'm missing something you should flag it you should raise your hand say what does this word mean what did you just say so those are following the sanskrit shravana adi shravana means hearing adi etc etc manana nididhyasana the three shravana manana nididhyasana vyatirikta other than these three vyatirikta other than these three vishaye bhya uh, matters or subjects other than these three manasa nigraha pulling the mind back from from things other than these three the next damaha damaha means 20 bahyendriyanam tad vyatirikta vishayebhyo nivartanam dama is the restraint of the external organs from all objects except that except that means that what that means shravana manana nididhyasana what was referred to earlier vedanta basically apart from your spiritual per, uh, pursuit restrain the external organs from external organs means your feet and your hands and your eyes and ears so one wants to take a walk and go somewhere one wants to see a movie or catch a broadway show all of it is nice one wants to go out and relax with friends over the weekend all of it is nice but when one has a high purpose like this one must pull back one must minimize or stop all activities all non essential things they have to be given up and this is nothing special any high pursuit if you are a writer if you are a scientist if you are pursuing any kind of career that demands attention uh, you have to give up uh, whatever distracts you and you automatically do remember when we were getting ready for university examinations how much we set aside everything else in life almost sometimes even forgetting to eat or sleep and i sometimes think that realizing god becoming enlightened is a little easier than getting through all the exams that we have gone through in our childhood or youth so it takes probably less effort and energy 
but focus is demanded uh, it a certain period of focus mastery in any field uh, who was that um, who spoke about the 10k rule 10000 hours rule um the uh, malcolm gladwell i read about it in gladwell's book yes malcolm gladwell so he studied um, the lives of masters in different fields and he found approximately they had put in 10000 hours of con concentrated practice so maybe 5 or 6 hours a day for a period of few hour, few years and they somebody was a bill gates was a coder and somebody else was a, an athlete and so on and somebody else was a writer but several thousand hours of practice goes in and then is a breakthrough it becomes you become a master of that something like that it's nothing very esoteric or nothing very mystical one must uh, bear down on the subject for some time. Then, so it, the meaning is clear here. Then the third of these six treasures is uparat, uh, is uparati. Literally, rati means engagement with uh, the world, especially with sensual pleasures. Uparati is the reversal of that, pulling back. Twenty-one. Nivartitanam etesham tad vyatirikta vishayebhya uparamanam uparati atava vihitanam karmanam vidhina parityagaha. So, two, two interpretations of uparati has given here. This is one of the third of the sixfold treasures. So, two interpretations. One, the time and energy that one has saved by Shama and Dhamma, that uh, one must not flow back into worldly activities to restrain oneself. So you, you know, a lot of people, especially young people, complain about distractions, complain about inability to maintain focus. It is the lack of this uparati. You're making an effort. Maybe you have a uh, study schedule all planned out, uh, how you're going to focus but they are surrounded by a variety of distractions and you tend to flow back into them again, once in a while, and it breaks the rhythm of the study. I was reading a book, new book on attention, and it says the dangers of you know, mobiles and social media and all, that little ping on the mobile, like maybe a text has come or something. It says when you are concentrating intensely, maybe, maybe studying or doing an assignment or something, and that one ping, and you pick up the mobile, look at it, and then put it down. That's all, few seconds. That one disturbance, it takes you around 21 minutes to get back into, into uh, that flow again. Imagine the tremendous disruption. You're studying for one hour, a single disruption, two disruptions. You, get, you take now 20 minutes, 20 minutes each to get back into uh, full concentration. So I don't know if that is true, but the point is that it, uh, the disruptions caused by these little distractions are quite big, are, are much larger, much more damaging than we thought. Just by the way, there is this new documentary, it's called The Social Dilemma. So a lot of young people I hear in universities and all, um, they are disturbed by this, by seeing how much of an impact social media has on, on us. And I've heard of people actually going off Facebook and Twitter and all the different kinds of social media platforms. Uh, they, they were scared by this new documentary. Uh, what kind of damage it does to concentration, to focus. Now, uparati, this one word here, uparati, is pulling back and not flowing back again into the world. Nivartitanam etesham, having with the ones which have been withdrawn. Etesham means shama and damadi mind and the external organs, which have been pulled back from being scattered in the world, which have been pulled back. Having pulled back and don't allow them to flow back again. Uparamanam means not, Ramanam means enjoyment in that. Don't go back and start, uh, you know, being in the midst, lapsing back into it. Don't do that. Um, or, Atava, alternative interpretation. I'll tell you what it actually says, but I'll tell you what it means. Atava, alternative, become a monk. That's what it means here. <laughs> Vihitanam karmanam vidhina parityaga. That's a technical way of saying become a monk. Vihitanam karmanam, the Vedic duties prescribed for householders. Vidhina, 
uh, in procedurally parityaga renounce procedurally renounce is the is the ceremony for becoming sasanyasi it is called uh, viraja homa so that is a vedic ceremony all monks have to undergo so that is basically your religion is telling you officially that you need not follow the uh, the the precepts the commandments of religion for household life anymore you are free because why are you free not because uh, i'm tired of it i give up i quit no because you're going to the next level that i want only god realization nothing else for that reason you're set free from all other obligations but for no other reasons so in in india monasticism was seen in this way everybody had certain obligations imposed upon them by religion this kind of ritual you have to perform these are the duties you have to perform uh, for your parents and so and so for so many things are there for society all of that you are set free from if you make make up your mind that i don't want anything in this world or in the next world i only want enlightenment then you can be set free from it and it he says here a secondary meaning of uparati could be just become a monk so he gives that option also vihitana recommended or or prescribed karma nam rituals these are vedic rituals vidhina parityaga parityaga renouncing renouncing not just giving up vidhina procedurally Um, with with the proper ceremony so a monks will let go of rituals but to let go of rituals also there is a ritual and that is called the viraja homa which is officially you are set free so if you do that then you are a monk 22nd titiksha text number 22nd तितिक्षा शीतोष्णादी द्वंद सहिष्णुता तितिक्षा इज द एंड्यूरेंस ऑफ हीट एंड कोल्ड एंड अदर पेयर्स ऑफ ऑपोजिट्स बेसिकली स्पिरिचुअल फॉर्टिट्यूड द वर्ल्ड विल थ्रो अ लॉट ऑफ ट्रबल एट यू नॉट जस्ट बिकॉज़ यू आर बीइंग स्पिरिचुअल आई एम बीइंग स्पिरिचुअल आई एम बीइंग परसिक्यूटेड फॉर इट मे बी इन सर्टेन रिस्पेक्ट्स बट व्हाटएवर वन वांट्स टू डू इन द वर्ल्ड यू वांट टू रेज अ फैमिली यू वांट टू मेंटेन अ रिलेशनशिप यू वांट टू होल्ड ऑन टू अ जॉब how much trouble you put up with from your youth to middle age to old age how much trouble you put up with so that much toughness must be there maybe you are sick but there is a client coming and you have to go out to the airport to meet him there is no excuse you have to go um, maybe you don't feel like it but the children have to be you know fed and gotten ready and seen off to school and then picked up from school you have to do it it's not it's not optional so you have gone through all of that so it takes a lot of toughness to get through the to the duties imposed by the world similarly in spiritual life also don't sacrifice your spiritual life because there are problems often what happens is there is illness or there is unhappiness there is some hassle in the world outside and uh, the first thing to be sacrificed is today there is too much work so i won't meditate and um, today my mind is disturbed i won't go to class no this is what is being said here whatever the world throws at you come um, what what is it high water hell or high water what is, i think what is the phrase phrase i will i will attend a class i will meditate i will pray whatever your spiritual practices you must do it i have seen so many such examples famous examples are of course there there was this disciple of chaitanya mahaprabhu so chaitanya mahaprabhu and his disciples are going to come to this person's house the evening will be spent and the night will be spent in kirtan in ecstatic singing and dancing and taking the name of the lord and the chaitanya mahaprabhu is coming to your house and that gentleman he got the news that his only son had died just that day and he never told anybody only he knew but somehow chaitanya mahaprabhu also knew the whole evening was spent in in taking the name of the lord in kirtan and then chaitanya mahaprabhu again mahaprabhu again and again went into samadhi uh, but he embraced that that man you know um, so that kind of spiritual toughness even the worst thing that the world will throw at me uh, i will not there is this story um, about m the writer of the gospel of sri ramakrishna it has so many such stories the writer of the gospel of sri ramakrishna m so he was in in um banaras at that time and he would read the uh, bhagavatam 
for the monks, if I remember correctly. Every evening after the Arati, there would be a reading and the monks would gather around. One day he was going to the reading and somebody came and there was a telegram, handed it to him. He read the telegram and he put it in his pocket and he went and he did the Bhagavatam reading. Somebody asked him, what was the telegram about? Oh, one of the monks said to the other monk when the reading was going on, do you know that telegram I handed him? Uh, his son or daughter has passed away. He hears this news. He puts it in his pocket and he goes on and, and does it. These, this is Titiksha. This is, of course, a very high order, very high order. Uh, I personally remember once I was sick in the hospital and I was on IV. Uh, I was lying down. So this intravenous is there. And I thought, okay, I am excused today. You know, like I'm sick. So I don't have to, I can do just a little bit of the japa and that's it, finished. After all, I'm very sick. And I saw this old monk who had been sent for an operation after the procedure was done, after the anesthesia wore off. I saw him sit up um, in the bed, hours together, facing the wall, sitting straight and meditating. So that was a lesson to me, this 80 plus year old monk who has just had an operation. He will not give up a single day's meditation. Swami, this is the story of Swami Vireshwaranji. This story was told by um, Bhaskaranji, who is the head of the Vedanta Society in Seattle now. So he, when he was in Belur Mat many, many years ago, at that time, Swami Vireshwaranji was the president of the order. And the Swami was not keeping well. He was very advanced in age. He was ill and high fever. So Swami Bhaskaranji went to see him in the quarters of the President Maharaj there in Belur Mat. And he saw Swami Vireshwaranji was sitting up propped by pillows and answering letters in those days by hand. And uh, Swami Bhaskaranji said, but, but Swami, I heard you were, you were sick, you were ill. You shouldn't strain yourself so much. So Vishwanji said, if a sadhu can sit up, he can work. In Bengali, he said, sadhu uthe boste parle kaj So that's the kind of Titiksha they wanted, spiritual toughness, fortitude. I remember you know, once, this is much lower level, at my level, I was a young monk. And one day I, I was actually a little sick. And uh, there was a meeting uh, at an ashram. And for certain reasons, I wanted to get out of the meeting. So I went to the once the senior monk who was organizing the meeting. I said, I'm not going to the meeting. I'm feeling sick. He said very calmly. Either you're in the hospital or you're in the meeting, one of the two. If you're really sick, then go to the hospital and stay there. Otherwise, come to the meeting. <laughs> so that's the thing that, you know, you have to be a little tough uh, on yourself. The famous definition of titiksha uh, given by Shankaracharya, it's quoted in this book, of course. This famous this definition we all have to memorize. Sahanam sarva dukkhanam um, apratikara purvakam. Chinta vilapa rahitam satitiksha nigatyate. Withstanding all kinds of suffering. Without, without you know, um, recrimination, without uh, grumbling, without complaint. And without too much effort to put things right. It says, apratikara uh, purvakam. Instead of being desperate to think, put things right. Chinta vilapa, without anxiety, without vilapa means regret and grumbling and complaint. That is called titiksha. Calmly go ahead with it. Go ahead with your duties, with your spiritual practice. Don't bother about the small problems of life, no matter how much they're troubling you. One thing is common sense. Common sense is very important here. I have said this earlier, and I'll repeat this example I've mentioned. When I was teaching the Brahmacharis in the training center, there was one young novice. So he took this to the extremes. He had a pain in the knee and he kept on flexing his foot in class. It was so distracting. He was flexing his foot in class. Why? It's hurting him. I said, why don't you get it treated? He said, no, I won't. He's practicing the tiksha, basically. I was putting up with all sorts of troubles. But in the meditation hall also, he's stretching his leg forward because he can't sit still. It's hurting him. So he is restless everywhere. I said, you're meditating on your knee. You should meditate on God. Get it treated and get it out of your system, whatever the problem is. So that's one extreme. Shouldn't go to that level where you're falling ill and your mind is on the body all the time. 
that kind of fortitude is no good please take medicine uh, diet exercise whatever get cured and go move on the whole point is to be spiritual not to suffer the opposite is too much anxiety about the body i i mentioned the uh, one young uh, novice who had a stomach pain and who i said this earlier again so um who was always anxious we were getting treatment for him he went to hospitals and consulted doctors nothing was working he was always anxious he was un- unable to eat because he felt it will hurt again the tummy pain will come back finally i told him one day that see everything is being done you are doing everything the doctors are doing everything we are arranging everything now leave it to god you concentrate on your study and meditation and work he is a very good monk so he did that immediately and later on he wrote to me that that was very good advice now the pain is also cured and i am very happy now and that was months later he went to some other ashram so too much um, don't pay attention whatever common sense do that and then bring your mind back to your spiritual practice then samadhanam this is focus number 23 nigrihitasya manasah shravanado tad anuguna vishaye cha samadhi samadhanam here samadhi means concentration focus what does this mean samadhan is the constant concentration of the mind thus restrained on hearing etc of the scriptural passages and other objects that are conducive to these so nigrihitasya manasa the mind which has now been restrained focused concentrated uh, has been pulled back from distractions now that must be focused see in monastic life in spiritual life you actually clear the decks for action you give up many other distractions and other responsibilities so that you have time and response a uh, time and energy for spiritual life now that extra time and energy don't waste it so this is where the the old trope of the lazy monk comes you know having no worldly responsibilities no worldly concerns and your food is provided by the householders you are begging for food and wandering from place to place the traditional monk it often turns out to be a beggar and whiling away time because the extra time and energy which that person has got for vedanta is not being used there it just wasted so don't do that that nigrihitasya manasa thus controlled mind the mind which is thus controlled engage it samadhi means focus concentrate on what shravanadu shravana manana nidhyasana on vedantic hearing reflection meditation tad anuguna vishaye and other things which are helpful to that maybe it could you are working in ashram or um, just um, it could be your daily little puja all things which are helpful to vedanta let me it could also be a little bit of yoga exercise and all just keeping your health all right if you are in an ashram taking care of the ashram taking care of your guru all of these are included into in in anuguna vishaye helpful activities um you will see the novices in the training center they study vedanta at the same time they serve the old monks they go to the main temple of sri ramakrishna maybe they are making a garland for sri ramakrishna they are cleaning the temple these are all anuguna vishaye these are not distracting you might say that do you have to study vedanta sara day and night no all other ancillary activities then number 24 shraddha guru upadishta vedanta vakyeshu vishwasah shraddha so shraddha means faith shraddha is the faith in the truths of guru vedanta as taught by the guru guru upadishta taught by the guru vedanta vakya the sentences of vedanta this means upanishadic sentences vishwasah faith what kind of faith a working faith that there is something to this why working faith see there are one kind of faith is god exists heaven exists in the vedic um, sense you had to have faith in the vedic sacrifices that they would get you to heaven because you don't see any direct result in this life you do vedic sacrifices and the promises at the end of your life after death you go to heaven how do you know so you have to have faith but it's not that kind of faith which is being mentioned here that's a faith that's like what is understood as religious faith faith in god which you don't see here it's like a working faith you follow this you will get enlightenment that much is the faith required if that even that is not there one will not pursue it 
you have to pursue it um, seriously. I often give an example of, suppose you enroll in a physics course at Columbia. So you have some amount of faith in the professor. You have some amount of faith in the syllabus and the textbook. You don't say that the textbook is fake news and the professor is a liar. If you start up like that, there's no way of learning anything. And that's also common sense. Everybody has that much faith in any endeavor that we take up. That much only is required. There is a funny story of in Vrindavan. Vrindavan is really the place of Krishna, Vaishnavas. So one Vaishnava Babaji, means Vaishnava monk, who decided to change tracks from bhakti track to jnana track, from devotional track to knowledge. So he goes to an Advaita teacher and says, I don't like that path. I think uh, the dualistic path. I want to take up the path of knowledge, non-dualism. Very good. So you start big from the beginning, Vedanta Sara. And then he comes to this, this place, you know, Viveka, Vairagya, all of that. And then Shraddha, faith in the teachings of uh, Vedanta and you know, Guru. And he says, you know, in Hindi, Kya hai Shraddha? To mere uh, Gopal Nandan kya dosh kiye the? What? Faith here too. Then what, what harm did my Gopal or my Krishna do? There is always being told, you have to have faith in Krishna, you have to believe in Krishna. He did not like that so much belief and faith. Who has got so much? And he comes to Vedanta and he is told here, you have to have faith in Guru and, and the Vedanta. He says, here too there is faith, there is belief. Yeah, but not like that. Finally, and most important, I would say, Mumukshutvam Mokshetcha. Mumukshutva is the yearning for spiritual freedom, intense desire for of spiritual freedom. This is one thing in this all that we have been studying, who is qualified for Vedanta? If, if you're lucky enough to have this desire, a strong desire for enlightenment, all the rest will come by itself. And Sri Ramakrishna used to say that the only thing needed is Vyakulata in the devotional language, intense discontent for God, restlessness for God realization. And then he quotes one verse and brings the topic to an end. The verse is from uh, one of Shankara's famous works, Upadesha Sahasri. So he's quoting first from Upanishad. Why is he doing that? So you'll find uh, the author is always keen to prove that what he's saying is uh, based on Upanishads. Vedanta is the teachings of the Upanishads. So are you, you know, like you are, they say, so kapola kalpitam. Are, are you imagining all this? Are you, uh, are you being creative? and uh, setting forth your own system or is it truly what Vedanta teaches? So once in a while he will justify. What I'm saying is, is just classical Vedanta. It's from the Upanishads or he'll quote the Gita or sometimes uh, the past masters like Shankara and Sureshwara Acharya and others. He does both here. He quotes Vyadarnik Upanishad and Shankara Acharya. So I'll read this and then stop and take questions. Evam Bhutaha Pramata Adhikari Shanto danta ityadi shritehe uktam cha prashanta chittaya jitendraya cha prahina doshaya yathukta karine gunan vitaya nugataya sarvada radeya metat satatam mukshave iti. So, such an aspirant is a qualified student. It is said in the Shruti, quiet, subdued, etc. It is further said. This is always to be taught to one who is of tranquil mind, who has subjugated his senses, who is free from faults, obedient, endowed with virtues, always submissive, who is all constantly eager for liberation. This is a quote from Upadesha Sahasri. Basically what it means is, is a quote from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Shantodanta, peaceful, controlled. What is it a reference to? Shama and Dhamma. So the teacher is saying, look, that Shama, Dhamma, etc., which I said, six treasures I mentioned, it is indicated in the Upanishads. Indicated. You will not find exactly this list. Remember, this is a compilation based on all the Upanishads together and a systematization. So whatever you read here, when we go to the Upanishads after this, you will find these things scattered all across the Upanishads. And the same thing Shankaracharya has said in this very beautiful verse. Qualifications of a student. That funny story is there that a student goes to an ashram to learn Vedanta. And he says, what can I do here? And somebody in the ashram says, well, there are two kinds of people here. There are students and there's the guru. Oh, 
what are the duties of a student? Well, the student has to be disciplined and get up very early in the morning. He has to serve the guru. He has to clean the ashram. He has to attend classes. He has to memorize, you know, verses and there'll be exams. Um, it's a tough life. Okay. And what does the guru do? Oh, he gives a few lectures maybe. Oh, good. I'll be a guru then. <laughs> so that nobody wants to be a student. Student has very strict qualifications. All right. So this is the first of the four. Qualified seeker. Fine. Let's look at the questions. Um, my, my question is relating to verse 17 and earthly <laughs> transient objects. You know, I attended this uh, academic conference, Science of Consciousness, last month, virtually, uh, run by University of Arizona, and uh, many of the luminaries in consciousness studies were there. And one of the plenary sessions was on psychedelics, psilocybin, as mainstream therapeutic tools in psychiatry. Hmm. And they see great potential in it. Hmm. And it's not transitory because it has to be taken only once, apparently, and the changes in consciousness are permanent. Hmm. Of course, the only problem is that these things are illegal. Hmm. But then I was also thinking about the, the ninth mandala of the Rig Veda, which is supposed to be the Soma mandala. Hmm. And, um, and it's a pian to its properties and all that. So these are earthly things, I guess, um, and, but also mentioned in the, in the, in the Vedas. So what is, your, what is your perspective on that? All right. First of all, um, using drugs to alter one's um, psychological state, uh, that is not something that would be recommended. Though the effects were well known. For example, the Patanjali Yoga Sutra actually mentions that by the use of certain drugs, one can have altered states of consciousness, which is what, what much later, um, um, you know, Alpert, Timothy Leary at, at Harvard, they were Harvard Ram psychologists. Das, yeah, yeah Ramdas, who became Ramdas later on. So they experimented and they started up the whole uh, the LSD culture and everything like that. Yes. Remember, it's not an alternation of consciousness. From a Vedantic perspective, it's, a, it's an effect on the mind. So, so there's a clear difference between the mind and consciousness. So it can have an effect on the mind. That's true. But remember, um, that's still transient. That which has a beginning will also have an end. When they say it has a lasting effect, it just means it's a long lasting effect. It just doesn't go away uh, so easily. It's more, it's more stable. That's what they mean for this particular drug you're talking about. Second, Yes, the Vedas do, do mention a lot of worldly results and other worldly results. There are, um, they, they, you'll find constant reference to may our progeny increase, may we have more cattle, may we have more wealth. Uh, that is repeated again and again. So the kind of um, things people in, uh, in the Vedic times might want um, for a pleasant life, for a good life. Of course it's there. So that's the lower kind of religion. That's what is called karma kanda. Remember, we are talking about Vedanta here. Vedanta is Upanishads. Upanishads are the final teachings of Vedanta. What we talked about in the earlier classes, the very meaning of Vedanta is the end, final, highest teachings of Vedanta. What are the other teachings? The other teachings are exactly what you are being asked to give up here. Those are also included in the Vedas. They are not Vedanta. What are the other teachings? By these rituals, by the worship of the Vedic gods, you get worldly prosperity. By the performance of Vedic rites, you get um, passage to heavens afterwards. But what is being mentioned here is all of that, all of them, as pleasant as they are, they're all product of karma. Being products of karma, they are impermanent. That's what was mentioned here. All the products of karma, which are impermanent, they are to be given up. Because you have already made a decision in your mind. Vairagya is the giving up of the impermanent. There's a difference between the permanent and the impermanent. The permanent is Brahman and the rest is impermanent. That which is impermanent, the Vedas, religion itself shows you a way, a religious way, a moral, ethical way of attaining your goals in life. Remember the four goals, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. Moksha is spiritual liberation. But what about the other three? There is Artha, worldly prosperity. There is pleasure, Kama. And there is Dharma, a morality. One way of understanding, understanding morality is good karma done. And the result of that will be artha and karma, pleasant things in this life. Um, 
another way of interpreting dharma is those ritualistic actions which will produce heaven in the life after this vedanta is saying all of that can no longer be your goal in life that is not spiritual that is very worldly this worldly or next worldly that is the vedic uh, understanding of conventional religion it's very much there all around you people go to churches and temples all the long lines in you know dakshineshwar kali temple where sri ramakrishna used to stay on tuesdays and saturdays you find long lines before uh, queues to offer pranams and puja to the divine mother kali are they all there for a vision of the divine mother like ramakrishna are they all there for moksha and brahma gyana not at all not at all they are there for exactly these things what you read in the uh, vedic uh, they are not there for cattle lot but they might want suvs and uh, jobs and um, you know whatever so yeah so there's the lower religion which in the vedic um, structure would be the karma kanda the ritualistic portion and there's the higher religion which is this vedanta where the goal is moksha otherwise what's the goal dharmartha kama religion tells you instead of pursuing it immorally instead of pursuing it instinctively trying to you know money and uh, pleasure that's all i want in life no that's not sustainable that's damaging for you that's bad karma for you and bad for society we will show you an ethical sustainable way of attaining your worldly goals and other worldly goals that's the that's there everywhere i mean in the christian church for example right here very popular form of um, um, christianity is what is called um, the prosperity gospel so there are people who say that jesus wants you to be rich that's a oversimplification of the term but why should you not do well in this life so that's the idea that this world but the real christianity is beyond this real christianity is god realization similarly in every religion okay then dimitri dimitri uh, uh hello uh, sorry yes. uh, i just recently joined and i'm uh, relatively new probably completely new to uh, this subjects and uh, i'm trying to understand when uh, we speak of i and do we mean in this particular context that there is a, some temporary i in the mind that is trying to you know achieve through efforts all of these qualifications and expand on these qualifications under the watch of the real life which is brahma true here the i just means the person dimitri because we have not yet started the inquiry into the i so the discovery of brahman or the atman the witness consciousness all of that is going to come later it's just the person who has come to learn vedanta these are the preliminary qualifications what does that person think of himself or herself i am this person i am swami or i am dimitri um, just this mix of body and mind mm-hmm. that what you're talking about that analysis will start later when as we enter into the actual subject matter these are preliminaries um then gabriel Shaker. says i also i think also aldous huxley used drugs yes he did in fact he was a disciple of uh, swami prabhavanand ji and that was one point where they disagreed swami prabhavanand prabhavanand ji in hollywood he told elder saxley again and again not to do it um so he was very interested in the effects of drugs on altered mind states and uh, swami prabhavanand ji said that that kind of samadhi those experiences are to be attained through yogic discipline not by taking drugs Uh, swami ji in uh, scriptures we hear the word sankalpa yes that, uh, does it mean strong will and does it help in god realization sankalpa means strong will yes it helps in god realization but remember when you hear the word sankalpa in a puja in a in a in a ritual there it means that desire you want to you know i i resolve to perform this puja of shiva or of narayana or the, or the devi may this these blessings descend upon us this the whole statement will be called a sankalpa and you do that before the puja so that's a ritual done with desire here the sankalpa is may we have um, may we have viveka vairagya the, the qualifications for um, spiritual life may we have devotion to god so that would be the sankalpa here may we hold on to this path until god realization sankalpa means the resolve that is taken 
when you start out on any kind of religious endeavor. It could be the ritualistic part of religion, the lower religion, worldly kind of religion, or um, this higher part. Why I'm saying this in Bhagavad Gita, you will find Sankalpa Prabhavan Kaman, Sarvan Tyaktva. Give up all activities or desires which are born of Sankalpa. So there Sankalpa means this resolve to you know, perform a puja, perform a ritual with a desire. Those things have to be given up for Vedanta. Um, you can see why people would think, so this means we have to become monks. This is what Krishna taught Arjuna. No, you can practice this wherever you are. It's an internal thing. A monastic life is a good uh, stage, a good setup for practicing this. But one can do that. Um, the whole point is to be monk-like internally. That's the whole point. All right. Uh, let me conclude here today. We have finished Adhikari, which is very important. Is These four things, Viveka, Vairagya, the six treasures, and Mumukshutvam. Um, these four are very important for our practical spiritual life. We will learn many, many things on this journey, very deep truths. But notice that when you have any serious problem or question about your practical, personal, spiritual life, it's always good to look back upon these four and see what's going wrong there. Always, mostly we will find something is lacking there. Okay, an important uh, secret to be shared here. I mentioned this earlier again and again. These, these four are mentioned whenever you start Vedanta. Most Vedanta texts will start with these four. One secret about these four is they are causally connected, not casually, causally. One, the first one causes the next one, next one causes the next, the third one, and so on. So what I mean by that is, if somebody feels one of them is lacking, don't fight your battle there. I don't have this passion. I still have a lot of desires. I'm struggling with this passion. Don't. That will be a tough battle. What it says is, that that is caused by the earlier one. This passion is the second one. What's the first one? Discernment, viveka. If vairagya is poor, if vairagya is not up to the mark, then go back to the earlier, uh, earlier practice, viveka, and strengthen that. Deepen your conviction. There is an ultimate goal of, uh, of a human life, a spiritual goal, really, really worth having. So many saints and sages in all religions strive for it, attained it. That is the purpose of my life. When you strengthen that, you come back into Vairakya, you will see your dispassion for other things has increased and your, like, your desire for enlightenment has increased. When you increase these two, Viveka and Vairakya, the disciplines of mind and body, Shama, Dhamma, Uparati, Titiksha, they will increase. When all these three are strong, then that intense desire for liberation, it will come. One can't force oneself to have an intense desire for liberation. Uh, you can't simulate that. You strengthen the earlier ones, the next one will come. So this is a good um, insight to have, that they are causally connected. One thing is weak, don't fight your battle there. Go to the earlier one and strengthen that one. Okay, on that note, let me end. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Shri Ramakrishna Parnamastu All right, take care. I pray to the Divine Mother. This is Durga Puja time this month. Divine Mother to protect all of us. Let me see all of you. Yes, to take care. All right. Hare Krishna.